so uh, now with the our um, last lecture for tonight is Dr. Um, Aloudu, uh, who's going to talk to us about enhanced recovery program, uh, the <coughs> basic principles and the uh, implementation challenges. Uh, and uh, the mic uh, with you, Dr. Aloudu. Okay. Um, I just want to thank um, um, the organizers of this meeting for having me do this presentation. I want to thank Dr. Imad, um, Dr. Walid, and Dr. A. Already the moderator of this uh, meeting. Um, I want to thank Dr. Madi so much because um, the history did back to about 20 years ago uh, when uh, I was a trainee under him. Um, Dr. Madi is a great man. Um, I have so much to say about Dr. Madi. Um, he's a man that speaks for the voiceless, very encouraging man. Um, I owe him a lot. Um, you know, all my training I did, I started my anesthesia training under Dr. Madi, um, was very, very committed. It was a, he's a great teacher. So when he contacted me to do this presentation for him regarding the ARS protocol for surgery, you know, I didn't have any doubts in my mind to actually jump into this and make sure, you know, I partake in these um, sessions. Um, for everybody listening as well, um, thank you so much for being part of this program. So very quickly, I'm going to be talking about the errors, um, enhanced recovery after surgery. Uh, my background is anesthesia, uh, but I have an affiliation for interventional pain medicine. Uh, I do a little pain intervention at the same time as well. Currently, I'm the pain director in Canada at the Lousy University. So, um, oh, just a second there. Good. Um, I don't have any financial disclosure, which is um, one thing that is expected of us to do before we start any presentations. Then um, I want to thank the American Society of Regional Anesthesia for your recent um, certificate of achievement based on all the work we do with regional anesthesia in surgery and MSK in interventional pain um, treatments as well. So I'm going to um, take this um, quote um, from uh, one of the British Medical Journal uh, which states that the immediate challenge to improving the quality of surgical care is not discovering new knowledge, but rather how to integrate what we have already known into practice. I know all through our careers as clinicians, we kind of um, learn about so many things, but um, the honors lies on us to be able to integrate all the things we learned into you know, our clinical practice and much more when it comes to the errors, you know, we're trying as much as possible, you know, to attenuate the surgical structure response they say the patient actually faces. Then apart from that, we want to maintain perioperative physiological function and to reduce um, the risk of post-operative complication at the same time to accelerate the recovery for most of the patient. So for the purpose of this presentation, I'm going to go through this outline, um, a small definition of what um, the errors um, protocol actually entails. Um, a small historical perspective. Um, what exactly um, does the ERAS protocol actually passes across to everyone? Um, I will have a look at the, the clinical pathways. Um, how ERAS can be implemented in different surgical specialties. Then apart from that, we'll talk about, is it actually beneficial? Do we have to do it? Does it make any difference for the patient? You know, there are some centers right now, they're not actually practicalizing on actually practicing the errors protocol does that change your practice i'll say yes and no then how do we implement this protocol then apart from that get through a small conclusion and a summary at the same time as well so um i'm not trying to scare anybody away with this my gory very gory picture um in the medieval times you can just imagine they didn't have any access to any anesthesia any anesthesia no form of analgesia at the same time most of the patients that do suffer ischemic limbs and are undergoing amputation. What do they happen to them? They don't have any form of pain relief for them. They, this patient are restrained to have the diseased limb literally amputated with people watching, no caution, no, no, no aseptic technique, no gloves, you know, no face masks. And this is what happened back then um, in the early 17th century. Now, in 1735, um, Dr. Amen, Claudius Amen, actually performed the first um, successful appendectomy, um, sometimes in London, um, in a little old boy. You can look at this picture here. Um, in 
holding the scalpel where there's no gloves in his hand. He doesn't have a face mask on. You know, you can look at the assistant and even the mom of the patient, you know, literally restraining the child to have this surgery, surgical intervention done. You can see how far we have come. Now, jumping onto um, the ETO dome, um, these are a few colleagues of ours, you know, they are re literally applying ETA anesthesia to facilitate a dental extraction. You can see Dr. Green Martin and Dr. John Collins, they're trying to implement this process by doing what? By giving the patient some amount of pain relief to make it easy for the process of a dental extraction, you know, to be implemented. Now, in 1904, um, the guys in uh, John Hopkins, they started, you know, taking some precaution. They started wearing gloves. And if you look at this group, you can still see none of them is wearing a face mask. So all the content of the nasal cavity, some of the sweat from their body is actually dropping into the wound and whereby causing more infection for the patient and increasing the post-operative complication for this patient. So putting all this together, you can see how far we come. Look at the modern time now. You can see, you know, the, the scrub nurse there having the face mask on, the surgeon performing the surgery, having the anesthetic clean gowns on. And you can see the anesthesiologist sitting on the chair, literally monitoring the amount of fluid that's being given to the patient, you know, monitoring the vital signs, at the same time trying to reduce the amount of complication you know, this patient has been exposed to. Now, moving on, for, moving on further, um, you can actually say now that um, a lot of microsurgery are being performed you know, with the advent of the ARS protocol. Then aside from these, currently, people are not performing robotic assisted surgery to limit the amount of complication, to limit the amount of blood loss, and to limit the amount of fluids this patient are actually exposed to during the um, perioperative period. So, um, as an introduction, the ARES protocol is the new standard for surgical recovery. And ARES after surgery is implemented, you know, and is based on, is patient focused, is standardized, is evidence based, and interdisciplinary property guidelines are actually implemented. Through all the phases of anesthesia from the preoperative um, period to the intra and the post-operative, they are literally stip stipulated guidelines that will help us with ensuring effective and adequate patient care. In 2000, in, in one of the um, um, JAMA publication, um, Linguist et al. actually look at the implementation of the ARES, uh, the ARES protocol and they find out that it literally reduces the post-operative complication, it reduces the length of stay in the hospital, then apart from that, it reduces the amount of readmission at the emergency department, you know, um, post-surgery. So how did, how did the um, ARES protocol actually start? It started back, far back in Europe, um, the group um, Professor Kelly, um, a colorectal surgeon was actually looking at uh, what they can do to literally reduce the length of stay of the patient. So what they do, they started implementing the enhanced recovery after surgery on most of their patients. And after some studies were conducted, they actually found that, that it reduces the length of stay for most of the patients having open colorectal surgery by two days. It reduces post-operative complication by about 30% and it reduces the hospital in hospital cost from the time the patient is admitted to the time the patient is discharged um, significantly. Now, aside from these, they find that there's no increase in readmission or increase in mortality for most of the patient. Currently in Canada, um, we have um, several provinces in this, in this country. Um, most of the province have actually adopted the ARES protocol and in most of their practice to actually, you know, um, facilitate patient care. So this is Professor Kellett. Um, he's one of the progenitors of the um, ARES protocol. He's done extensive work, extensive research. Just in one of the recent publications in 2018, uh, himself and Professor Jury, they actually review the amount of flu the patient requires the patient requires before and after the surgery just to make sure the extracellular lung fluid is not too overloaded. 
So what are the goals of the ARES pathway? The first thing we want to ensure, we want to ensure early recovery for most of the patient. Aside from this, we want to negate or remove any barriers to adequate recovery. In terms of early recovery, we want to make sure the patient gets back to the baseline function as quickly as possible. We want to make sure the quality of life during the recovery process is actually secured. Then what are the things that will cause a delay in discharge or worsening the state of the patient? If the patient's pain control is not well, is not adequately managed, it could lead to a barrier in the, in the prompt discharge for this patient. Um, Post-operative nausea and vomiting, if excess fluid is being given to the patient. If the patient is not mobile as soon as the surgery is done, then the risk of the patient developing um, deep vein thrombosis or pulmonary embolism is actually very heightened. That the sleep disturbance or any complication from the surgery, this could lead to barriers in getting the patient out of the hospital, you know, as quickly as anticipated. So all across the globe, um, there's, a, there's a society being looked at by Professor Linquis called the um, Enhanced Recovery After Surgery Society. It was actually, it's, it's been growing constantly. It's currently all across the globe, you know, from Asia to North America to South America, even to some part of Africa right now, they've actually adopted the ERAS protocol and with attending reduced complication in most of the patient outcomes. Now, in Canada, um, in out of all the 10 provinces we have, um, most of the provinces have actually adopted the ERAS protocol on their sites. So um, just to go through um, the steps or the stages involved in the ERAS enhanced recovery after surgery. Um, I've actually numbered those steps um, from number one to number six. The first one is the outpatient clinic. Interestingly, in my center, um, we actually have um, a preoperative assessment clinic in which most of the patients come into the scene by the anesthesiologist before they go for surgery. Not all centers have access to this kind of a clinic, but sometimes some surgeons see the patient in their outpatient clinic so we literally expect the surgeon to give the patient all the required educational leaflets regarding the surgery you're going to be having. The indication for the surgery, and they need to intimate them at the same time with the complication that could arise from the surgery. Some of the patients are actually tutored about um, bowel preparation, taking adequate baths, before the surgery. Then aside from that, they talk to them about the different multimodal approaches um, that could be applied um, for pain control. In the pre-operative assessment clinic, uh, we go through the different techniques that we're gonna apply for this surgery. They're already having a local anesthetic or, or regional anesthetic, or they're having what we call a neuroaxial technique at the same time as well. Now, if the patient has been well-educated, it literally allays the anxiety they go through. If the patient doesn't know, then the anxiety is for the item. When the anxiety is heightened, it literally leads to what we call an a increase in the stress response, which is actually not so good for the patient. So in the preoperative area, um, the patient is actually um, given some preemptive pre analgesia. In my center right now, um, before you come in for any surgery, we give them some non steroidal anti-inflammatory in terms of Tylenol or paracetamol. We give them some um, ibuprofen at the same time as well. Um, we plan the, the different kind of regional techniques we're going to use this for this patient, that we do a regional block or even insert an epidural for the patient based on the kind of surgery they're going to be having. In the recovery room, as soon as the surgery is over, we literally encourage early oral intake in the recovery room. Then apart from that, we get the patient to sit out of their recovery bed, you know, as quickly as possible, you know, and all through the other steps as well, give the patient the necessary information they need to know so that in case any complication arise, they know who and what to call and what to contact after the surgery. This is a general overview of the steps actually involved in the ARS protocol, starting from the preoperative period. Um, we talk about no use of any pre-medication. What does that, what does that, what does that mean? We try as much as possible not to give the patient. We try as much as possible um, 
uh, not to give the patient any pre-medication in terms of um, benzodiazepines because um, we've been found that it actually delay, delayed the patient um, recovery, recovery time. Then we actually try to avoid any prolonged fasting. Uh, at the same time, uh, there's a use of carburetor loading. Uh, we we'll talk about the readmission um, risk that the patient could be equally be, um, be exposed to at the same time as well. Um, there's a use intraoperatively. Uh, we try to maintain nomotamia, um, avoiding excess food loading, analgesia, um, depending on the kind of surgery the patient is having. We talk about the use of metoracic epidurals, um, reduce, reduction in the use of energy tubes, prevention of nausea and vomiting, avoidance of salt and water intake, early removal of catheters and the NG tube, early oral nutrition, non-opioid analgesia has been encouraged, and early mobilization and stimulation of the gut uh, in terms of the use of, um, of chewing gum to literally stimulate um, the, um, the, the gastrointestinal um, system. So um, what are the background? We actually compared the traditional um, versus the... The other thing you want to do is just to compare the traditional care versus the error scare. Um, what does this entail? What does this entail for the patient? In the traditional care, um, most of the care that is provided for this patient are actually the provider focus. is on what the physicians want to do, not necessarily what is actually warranted for the patient. You know, there's high variability and most of the traditional care that have been offered to the patient in the past is actually physician driven. Now, what about the error care? The error care is more patient focused, is standardized, is evidence based, and much more is equally interdisciplinary at the same time as well. Now, very quickly, I'm going to consider all the errors clinical pathway. What are the C score principle that is applicable to any surgery? Both gastrointestinal surgery, urological surgery, cardiothoracic surgery, spinal surgery, and anybody having neurosurgery. The first thing in part of the core principles include patient engagement, um, adequate nutrition, um, improving the patient mobility, perioperative fluid management, pain relief, and best practices which are equally evidence-based. So in terms of patient engagement, what are we trying to do? Patient engagement is actually integral to the success of the enhanced recovery process. Um, it is so important that when the patient is well informed before they come for their surgery, loads of articles out there actually support that it actually decreases patient anxiety, the fears about the surgery, it reduces post-operative complication, it lessens the use of post-operative analgesia. Uh, the most important thing for the hospital administration, it has been found to shorten the hospital stay. So for most of our centers, when the patient comes through, we literally give them what we call um, the patient educational toolkit. They have a small book they read through, they have um, the auto visual they go through, intimating them about the processes expected of them. Some of the patients still undergo bowel preparation. We tell them what and what to do. In terms of the fasting guidelines, we give them all the instructions as well, when they need to stop drinking and when they need to stop eating. We give them the carbohydrate loading. The way to mix it, all the information is actually contained in the patient educational toolkit. In terms of fasting, um, the Canadian Anesthesiology Society um, actually recommend that you know, uh, patients should be encouraged to drink clear fluids up to two hours before anesthesia administration. You know, uh, one of the cases I had to do, um, a gentleman has been waiting for about six months to have um, his um, knee replaced. He was told by the preoperative nurse to have some clear food two hours before the surgery. And what did this man have? He had a glass of alcohol because it was clear fluid. Unfortunately, we need as clinicians to give them very clear and pristine instruction about what and what the patient is expected to do. Now, the whole essence of the ERAS protocol is to reduce the physiological stress response. Now, if there's and stress within the system. When the patient is faced with the stress of surgery, what happens? They produce a lot of glucose, the cortisol pathway, 
uh, is actually I think leading to insulin resistance, meaning there's a decreased uptake of glucose by the muscles and paraventure there's lots of muscle mass before the patient comes to the surgery. And when there's hyperglycemia, it leads to heightened inflammatory process, increased risk of infection, and endothelial dysfunction and cardiovascular complication at the same time as well. So, so many publications out there have actually supported um, the use of carbohydrate loading uh, before, before, before the patient comes for surgery. And it's been equally been encouraged in patients that are equally diabetic at the same time as well. Now, for the, the Canadian Nutrition Tax folks, actually recommend that in, that in over 45% of surgery patients, they find that this patient, they were at risk of malnutrition. So they encourage that the patient need to be assessed when they come in for surgery. This actually falls into the categories of patients really having cancer surgeries. So um, what, we are what we tend to do um, is the introduction of solid or semi-solid or liquid on day one or day zero as soon as the surgery is done. It has been found that it does not increase the rate of wound infection or it doesn't worsen the risk of anastomotic deicence. It prevents bowel obstruction. Then apart from that, the use of antiemetics actually reduces you know, the risk of nausea and vomiting. Then apart from that, it facilitates adequate intake. Oral nutrition supplement on post-op day one is encouraged to reduce the time to tolerating all the meals the patient actually takes. There are a few publications out there. Um, the one that is very, very notable in the ERAS um, um, protocol is the one published by Nobet et al., they look at the preoperative oral carbohydrate loading in colorectal surgery, more like a randomized control trial. So the whole essence of this, of this study was they look at 36 patients, which were divided into three groups. You have the completely fasted group, they didn't take any liquid or any water. You have the preoperative um, group that had only water, and you have the group that had only carbohydrate drink. Now, looking at the outcome, what were, they, what were they trying to achieve from the primary outcome? They are looking at the time to the first um, flatus, the first bowel movement, and the hospital stay. Overall, you know, after putting all the data together, they found out that the patient that had oral carbohydrate loading before the surgery, they had reduced length of stay, and they have early return of normal bowel function. If you look at, if you backtrack a little bit, and look at the results. For patients that had lengthened hospital stay that were totally fasted, they stayed in hospital six days extra. And by paraventure, I'm sure that's not economically beneficial for the hospital. Another publication by Nigren et al., um, they found that a patient that had um, carbohydrate loading, they have um, reduction in the insulin resistance compared to people that were completely fasted overnight. In terms of mobility, as we all know, as clinicians, we try as much as possible to make sure our patient, you know, start mobilizing as early as the surgery is done. Uh, the whole essence of increasing mobility is to reduce insulin resistance, to, to reduce the risk of muscle atrophy, at the same time to improve the functional capacity of this patient. Um, it's all, 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 all well, being, well being published in most, all over the journal. Um, I'm taking this from the Journal of um, Orthopedic Surgery. They found that uh, the patient that have prolonged bed, uh, bed rest, um, they literally suffer lots of complication um, post recovery. And it's actually been encouraged that as soon as the surgery is done, uh, that this patient is encouraged to ambulate. And in the study they conducted, they found that few of the patients actually are exposed to having developing deep thrombosis, pulmonary embolism, and overall, they have a reduced hospital stay. So very quickly, I'm going to be talking about the perioperative fluid management. Um, the goal-directed fluid therapy seems to be the go-to guidelines when it comes to the ERAS protocol. But right now, we're trying as much as possible to limit the amount of fluids being given to the patient because it's been well documented that when the patient is given liberal fluid, the risk of developing pulmonary edema 
um, reduction in the gastrointestinal function and post-operative complication and prolonged recovery are highly documented. So in terms of pain control, uh, this seems to be my niche, um, making sure the patient have adequate pain control for any kind of surgery they're having. And overall, a multimodal pain management pathway has been actually been encouraged. Um, the use of analgesic targeting different mechanisms of action, both in the periphery and the central nervous system. We want to, as much as possible, if it's possible to avoid the use of opioids, we want to transition to oral medication as quickly as possible. Um, epidural analgesia is actually advocated for patients having open gastrointestinal procedure. For patients having laparoscopic procedure, you know, epidural might not be something we want to encourage because the whole essence of patients having a laparoscopic procedure is, is to reduce the amount of pain the patient is having. Uh, Neuroaxial techniques has been encouraged for most of the patients having joint replacement surgery. You know, if I cast my mind back during my residency program, uh, back in Ireland, then St. John, um, in um, St. John Hospital in Limerick, uh, most of the orthopedic cases that were done, I would say 95 out of 100% of them were done under neuroaxial techniques. I'm going to take my time to just explain these because um, um, if everybody can understand this um, very busy slide I have here, it makes my work so, so easy. Number one, when there's a surgical insult to any patient, what happens? You're going to have the pituitary, the ACTH, and the cortisol causing increased gluconeogenesis. And when this happens, what is going to happen? It leads to hyperglycemia. The advanced, the AGEs, the advanced glycosylation end product have been well elaborated. And what happened? This advanced glycosylation end product, they bind to the receptors. And when they bind to the receptors, it causes a lot of inflammatory reaction and the elaboration of all kinds of oxidative products that have been implicated in causing um, lots of complications for most of the patients. So what are the factors contributing to insulin resistance? Uh, we talk about um, uh, patient, the premorbid state of a patient, a patient is exposed to uh, having cancer, morbid obesity, metabolic syndrome, diabetes, and poor functional status. Then apart from these, one of the very important factors that contribute to the insulin resistance is pain. When pain is not well adequately managed, what will happen? It leads to a lot of complication and delay in hospital discharges. Apologies again for this very busy slide. In terms of pain control, you know, going through all the pathway for the pain control, um, from the periphery, you have the transduction, transmission, modulation, and perception of the pain at the central neural axis. Now, at different levels of the conduction pathway, there are different form of therapies that could be applied to make sure the trauma of the surgery being inflicted on the patient is not badly felt. At the level of the periphery, it's possible to give the patient some local anesthetic infiltration. We give most of our patients acetaminophen before they come for the surgery. Uh, we give some um, opioids as well. Uh, we load them with opioids before they come in. Um, pharmacological inter intervention include the use of local anesthetic, non-steroidal at the level of the dosa root ganglion. Now, if the patient is having a spinal, which come at the level of dosa root ganglion, you can actually combine both the local anesthetic and your opioids at the same time as well. And centrally, you have drugs like the alpha-2 agonist in terms of dexmedetomidine, um, clonidine, uh, your morphine, your fentanyl, and uh, helping with the pain control in the central neural axis. For the ARES protocol, um, the multimodal pain management has actually been encouraged. Um, and the whole essence of this is to reduce the stress, it reduce insulin resistance, and if facilitate mobility. So for different kind of surgery, um, I have this other busy slide that actually showed the different surgical intervention and what are the um, intervention that can be recommended for this patient in terms of pain control. And what are the grade of evidence or what are the grade of recommendation? If a patient is having gynecological surgery or oncological surgery, 
there's a place for the use of non-steroid anti-inflammatory. You can see the recommendation right beside it that is I if the patient is having colorectal surgery. If it's open colorectal surgery, it is advocated that the patient have a thoracic epidural, or aside from that, if the patient is having bariatric surgery, you can either run your regional anesthesia, which actually scores a very high point. Then if the patient is having pancreatic surgery, like all your repos procedure, it is advocated that the use of thoracic epidural is actually very effective in this patient. One thing I've found out in my very short career, um, the patient having cystectomy um, with iliac conduit, they stay longest in the hospital. You know, for some of the patient on an average, they stay up to seven to 18 days in the hospital post-surgery. So using epidural for this patient, you know, takes a very high recommendation and effective pain control, less complication, less ileus, and less anastomosis dehiscence for most of this patient. In, um, in 2018, Mark Kong et al., they actually explored the use of intratical morphine for laparoscopic surgery, and they found it's very, very effective. For most of the patients having laparoscopic surgery, instead of doing an thoracic epidural, they did a single shot intratical morphine injection. And within 24 hours, the amount of pain the patient actually observed was very minimal compared to, uh, to the placebo. Apart from these, um, the group from Stanford, uh, Marino and Schrockman et al., they look at the patient having total knee replacement. Um, they actually use preemptive analgesia for this patient uh, before the surgery. They give them acetaminophen and Celebrex. And all the patients having the knee surgery um, were exposed or were offered a modified adoptive canal block. And all the patients they receive spinal anesthesia unless there's a contraindication talking about coagula, uh, coagulability, if the patient you know, is on um, warfarin, is on Plavix, and is not being discontinued before they come for the surgery, then definitely uh, they won't be candidate to receive uh, spinal anesthesia. Then aside from these, they encourage that all the patients receive multimodal therapy, early ambulation, and reduce opioid dosing. So what are the best practices? As listed out here, um, as much as possible, we want to um, appropriately use and remove NG tubes and IV access as quickly as possible. You want to avoid delayed use of urinary catheters. In that center now, even if you have an epidural in place, within 24 to 48 hours, we take out the epidural, we, we take out the urinary catheter to encourage the patient to ambulate. Just to let us know that urinary tract infection are the most common type of hospital acquired infection. And most importantly, we want to encourage the patient uh, to move as quickly as possible. Still on the surgical best practices, um, we encourage the use of perioperative antimicrobial coverage. It's part of the timeout. You know, when the timeout has been read out, uh, the patient needs to get an appropriate antibiotics. Appropriate air removal, instead of shaving, we talk about air clipping. Um, keeping the temperature, uh, the temperature of the room and the temperature of the patient as warm as possible, maintenance of perioperative glucose control, preoperative mechanical bowel obstruction. For some patients, if they're having left side bowel surgery, they might need to have bowel preparation. But if they're not having left side bowel surgery, you know, bowel preparation have actually not been well advocated. Now, this is just a study here um, by Karen Slim. Um, they look at um, um, the, the benefit or the role of mechanical bowel preparation before colorectal surgery. And what was their finding? They look at over 5,000 patients. And all through the review, they did not find any complication in terms of pelvic abscess, anastomotic leakage in patients without mechanical bowel preparation for colonic surgery. If you're going to ambulate the patient as quickly as possible, it is actually advocated that we ensure that the patient has venous thromboembolism prevention in terms of timely dosing the airframe. In that center now, if the patient is having an open bowel surgery and it is mandatory that the anesthesiologist give the airframe 
function as the epidural is actually cited. At the same time, um, I actually love this image here, you know, just letting us know the risk of an embolism and the risk that fever is bleeding. For some of the surgical procedure that you anticipate that a patient is going to have extensive bleeding, you might hold your thromboprophylaxis until after the surgery. Um, just to bring this to our attention at the same time as well, um, the risk that the patient is actually exposed to, you know, when um, you're using airframe and when you're having a traumatic thoracic epidural. If the patient did not receive any airframe and you didn't have, you have an atraumatic instrumentalization of the back, the risk of the patient have an epidural hematoma from an atraumatic instrumentalization is one in 220,000. Compared to when the patient has an airframe and you instrumentalize the back in less than one hour, the risk increases to one to 8,700. That is very, very high. So as clinicians, um, in certain epidural in patient, we should be aware of all these risks at the same time as well. So, talking about our enhanced recovery flow chart, what are the steps for centers that don't currently have an ARS protocol in their center? These are the things you can do to actually implement this process. The first thing you want to do, you need to educate the patient, family education, patient optimi optimization, rehabilitation and carbohydrate loading in the preoperative phase. Then in the intraoperative phase, you want to make sure you avoid you know, excessive use of opioid. You want to employ multimodal analgesia. You want to reduce the amount of fluid being given to the patient. You want to prevent no more, you want to prevent hypothermia. You want to ensure no more thermia, no more glycemia, avoid the use of NG tubes, drains, and unnecessary intravenous insertions. In the post-operative phase, early nutrition, early mobilization, multimodal analgesia, nausea and vomiting treatment, and you want to avoid excessive use of fluids, and you want to follow a very strict discharge criteria, giving the patient the necessary contact post-discharge. Some people have asked the question, is the ARAS protocol of any benefit? I have two interesting studies that are coming out of Canada, one from the McGill University, uh, where they actually demonstrated that the patient that on the wall, the ARAS protocol, they have shorter hospitalization, they have decreased resource utilization and lower societal costs and overall. Another study coming out, out of Alberta, which was published in the Canadian Journal of Surgery in 2016, they find out that a patient that had an enhanced recovery pathway for their elective polyelectric surgery, they demonstrated a reduction in the emergency department visit and a reduction in the visit to the general practitioner, a reduction in the length of stay, and most importantly, to the administration, they find that for every $1 invested, in the ARS protocol, uh, it brought in about $3.58 in return for the hospital. So what are the tasks involved? For the ARS protocol to be implemented, we all need to work together. The surgeon, the anesthesiologist, and the nurses at the same time. The anesthesiology often at times um, at the ARS protocol, but at the same time, we need the consent and the agreement from other surgical specialty to actually facilitate the effectiveness of this um, process. Unfortunately, we can't do it alone. Um, as the orthopedic surgeon, the general surgeon and anesthesiology, we need to work together, you know, identify the patients that need special care. Even orthopedic surgeon sees a patient that have atrial fibrillation, just so important that they need to send a consult as appropriate to the anesthesiologist the patient can be seen before they come in for the surgery. So for the patient, a uh, few of the instructions we give some of our patients is um, uh, smoking cessation is quite important, uh, reduction of alcohol consumption, increased physical activities. They follow all the recommended preoperative instructions that have been given either at the preoperative assessment clinic or at the clinic of the surgeons. 
And most importantly, the patient needs to actively participate in the post-operative recovery period. For perioperative staff, uh, most of the staff working either in the clinic or working in the recovery area, we need to educate the patient about the current fasting, nutrition, and perioperative guidelines, and nutritional screening. This is very essential for patients that have that undergoing cancer surgery that have been cathartic or emaciated as a result of the malignancy they're going through. It's so important that, that the functional status of the patient needs to be equally assessed at the same time as well. Unfortunately, if these things go right, we've been blamed so many times for so many things. They blame the anesthesiology that the room is too hot, the room is too cold, there's global warming, Donald Trump's hair, and so many things. So it is so important we work with the surgeon all in an aim to facilitate effective patient care. Now, if we carry the patient, if they carry the surgeon along, I'm sure complaint like this wouldn't come up at all. You know, complain about, you know, you're taking too much time to do your spinal or to do your, or to get in your epidural. But the anesthesiologists uh, want to, as much as possible, want to um, avoid the use of long-acting sedatives, um, ensure the use of multimodal management, appropriate prophylactic antibiotics. You want to maintain pneumothermia. You want to limit the amount of fluids that you're giving to the patient at the same time as well. Now, um, a recent publication um, coming out of India, they look at um, the role of the anesthesiologist in impl implementing the ERAS protocol. Uh, talk about the use of um, adequate pre-medication, carbohydrate loading, multimodal analgesia, prevention of hypothermia, and avoidance of post-op nausea and vomiting. Unfortunately, the surgeon cannot ensure all these things. The almost lies on the anesthesiology to facilitate all these. Okay, for the surgeon as well, um, they contribute accordingly at the same time too. And um, I think um, this, this is um, basically, sorry, Dr. Madi, can this come up for me, please? Uh, okay, a few, a few seconds, yeah, it's fine, yeah, take it. Yeah, just to Thank take you. off this, um, uh, just one second. Okay, good. So um, I, I just left this slide in place as well, just for people to see that um, evaluating the effect of um, chewing gum um, has been found to encourage the recovery post colorectal surgery. And often at times the patient um, has actually been very delighted that even after the surgery, they're able to have the chewing gum and it's been found that this increases intestinal recovery and reduce the length of stay post-operatively. So in implementing this, for this to work in any center, we need to identify a champion. In our center, uh, we have a nurse that looks after the ERAS protocol and it feeds back to the, to the surgeon and it feeds back to the anesthesiology service as well. So about once or twice weekly, we have a meeting to just go through the process to make sure we don't have any lag in face in the implementation of any of our NRC recovery programs. So, in summary, the NRC recovery program is the implementation of patient-focused, standardized, evidence-based, interdisciplinary property guideline. And the implementation of the ERAS protocol um, reduces the post-operative complication and reduces the length of stay for the patient. Then apart from that, it's been well published that economic impact assessment recognized investments um, are much more than a strong financial return um, for any hospital that actually involved in these processes. So um, just to go over this again, for these to uh, be effective, we need to identify a champion. There should be a frontline engagement, audit of the clinical practice. At the same time, we have a close look regular reporting and continuous improvement at the same time as well. Now, um, I'm just gonna leave these pictures here. Uh, one of the small centers in, in Canada, um, only about two years ago, they, were in, uh, they didn't have the ERAS protocol in place. So I got involved with one of their surgeons. Um, this is um, um, Professor um, David. Um, we started the ERAS protocol together and amazingly, the outcome in this center has been absolutely encouraging. So um, thank you very much. Uh, these are uh, part of the people I work with as well. And thank you so much for um, listening to me. Thank you. <clears throat>
Dr. Reedy. Thank you very much, Dr. Lojashi, uh, for this um, um, amazing presentation, amazing comprehensive presentation as well. Uh, it is very um, interesting, um, I think, um, topic uh, currently, especially in, 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 in Egypt. We don't have um, a lot of uh, um, enhanced recovery programs, but it is well established in the, in the Western uh, side of the, of the world. Um, and I think in the Eastern side of the world, I think that it, it is still uh, a growing concept. Uh, so a few questions, uh, um, if, if it's all right. Uh, so starting with, uh, what about the enhanced recovery uh, program in cardiothoracic um, uh, surgery? Um, have you got any experience with it? Um, what, what do you think about it? Um, basically, in my center, what we do currently is um, all the patients, as usual, uh, we are literally encouraged the use of multimodal analgesia for most of the patients. Then apart from that, on-table trans thoracic fascia plane blocks oh, right. we do a lot of blocks for those patients mm -hmm. you know where they're going to be having the insertion around the sternum area we do a block for them we use intravenous infusion of ketamine desimetumidine during the surgery and i'll say you the outcome has been absolutely remarkable for most of our patients so um in almost all the surgical specialties um you can literally do the ARES protocol in urology um in patient having spine surgery um, in patients having esophagectomies, in craniotomies as well, there's a place for ARES protocol. In patients having um, thoracic surgery at the same time, there's a place for ARES protocol. In patients having nephrectomy at the same time, there's a place for the ARES protocol as well. Almost it cuts across every single surgical specialty. It's a protocol, it's a protocol that is applicable to every surgical specialty. In my center right now, it's something we have actually adopted. Most of the patients, um, as of in the past, when you have to fast them overnight, they don't seem to enjoy that at all. But right now, they have you know, that opportunity to drink something two hours, a clear food two hours before they come for the surgery, and it literally contributes to the reduction of the surgical stress they actually go through. Brilliant. Uh, another question here is about, uh, I think it, uh, it is, uh, it's about the uh, internal CO2, but, but I, I think the, the, it is the concept of, of optimizing everything, uh, especially uh, if, if general anesthesia is going to be uh, the mode of anesthetics. So mm. it's about endotelial CO2. So uh, what happens or from your experience, especially like the patients who not being ventilated properly during surgery, does that affect the, the, um, the recovery? Uh, does that prolong the hospital stay? Oh, um, interestingly, you just, just said something very important there. If the entire that CO2 is raised, you know, there's going to be a, a metabolic imbalance. And the best way for you to actually detect that is that it becomes, the patient either become acidotic, either respiratory, or become metabolic acidosis. Um, before the surgery, this can be adequately corrected. Now, if the patient is retaining CO2 during the surgery, definitely it's going to affect, you know, um, waking up very well, you know, you're giving your muscle relaxant, reversal, is going to affect the whole process. So if the patient is not adequately ventilated, the risk of um, neuromuscular paralysis um, at the end of surgery is definitely, definitely imminent. But with the access to all forms of investigation you have, you have intra op access to an arterial blood gas machine. You can literally, you know, blow off the excess CO2 that's been retained to make sure this doesn't happen. Then apart from that, the reduction in the use of pre-medication. In my center right now, the use of midazolam, um, temazepam, um, aprazolam is completely out of the picture because we want the patient that wakes up with a very clear sensorium. There's no point giving too much midazolam to a 70-year-old having spinal surgery and they are still too sedated at the end of the surgery. It does not encourage you know, respiratory activities for those patients. Um, another question about the local anesthetic concentration that you use um, uh, in the epidurals in your center uh, okay. uh, for um, intraoperatively and postoperatively, what, what do you use? Uh, okay, I'm just going to talk about uh, what I do um, uh, personally. Um, the hospital as a protocol, um, the constitution of the local we use, we use 0.1 probivacaine with hydromorphone. Okay. So we run the infusion based on 
the level of pain the patient has. Now, most of the nurses are both the recovery and on the ward. They've actually been tutored to be able to monitor the sensory level the patient has. If the patient gets to recovery room and has a sensory level of a T4, we need to ensure the patient can roll from side to side. They can bend their knee. It doesn't affect their respiratory effort before they are sent off to the ward. So most of the concentration we use is actually 0.1 per bubble with hydromorphone for all our patients. Uh, all right. Uh, another question about the carbohydrate load. Uh, do you use it in diabetic patients? Yes. Um, if you're using diabetic patients, just make sure you have your acute check monitor in, in the OR so you can check the blood glucose. For patients that are diabetic, as we all know, you know, you can go with the, um, the GKI, you know, stop the oral, um, oral hypoglycemic agent they're using before they come into the surgery. You can start your insulin dextrose infusion at the same time. If you keep an eye on the blood glucose of the patient, there's no problem with using it. I use it in all the diabetic patients just as normal. I will not have one single complication in any of our patients at all. Brilliant. Um, I would like to, say, to um, um, thank all the uh, speakers today. Uh, it's been an amazing night. Uh, and um, uh, I, to be honest, I'm, I'm, I, was, I, was, um, I was really honored to moderate this session. Uh, and I hope to see you again in the future uh, with us, um, with, with more topics and, and more uh, lectures. Um, I would like to thank Dr. Um, Amr Safwat, uh, Dr. Um, uh, Ansari, and uh, uh, Dr. Solo for, for um, uh, this lovely um, uh, night. Uh, and I would like to thank all the audience. I would like to thank Dr. Um, Saad Mahdi and all the other organizers. Um, uh, I think that will uh, conclude our session tonight. Um, Again, we're waiting for uh, for you in the future. Um, uh, we've got a, a very uh, a good program, um, uh, and it, it is published uh, online. Um, so we'll wait. We'll wait for you uh, in the near future. Thank uh, you very much. Next session will be a purely a pain session. Uh, Dr. Brof Makarita and uh, Dr. Mura Mubarak and Dr. Tolo will be um, honoring us to be a moderator of that session. So we'd love to see him again, inshallah. Thank, thank you. you very much, everybody. And well, once again, thank you, Dr. Madi, for thank the you. good work you're doing. Love. We appreciate you so much. You're a good man. You're a great man. Thank you so much lovely, lovely for to being have a you, great Dr. man. Tolo. Lovely thank to you. have you. Thank you, and Dr. Everybody. Madi. Thank you. Thank, thank you very much. much. Thank you, Prof. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, really. Take thank care you. now. Thank you very much. Thank Take you. care. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.